Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Additive Slack Podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Ahlefeld, and today we have the privilege of speaking with a distinguished figure in the field of additive manufacturing, and that is Nima Shamsay. Nima is a Philpott West Point Stevens Distinguished Professor at Auburn University, and he's also the director of the National Center for Additive Manufacturing Excellence, or NCAME. At NCAME, Nima and his team are really on the forefront of research and technology and are actively driving the adoption of additive manufacturing, if you will. With facilities hosting close to a dozen additive manufacturing systems on the metal side, extensive testing capabilities, and many more capabilities of NCAME, Nima and his team are truly shaping the future of additive manufacturing. And that's why we're here to talk to him today. So without any further ado, Nima, it's an honor to have you on the show. All the honor is mine. Thank you for the invitation and great introduction. Yeah, thank you. I'm very curious about your background and how you got to where you are today. We just talked before clicking record, and I think one of the key key points that are very interesting about your career is that you spend a lot of time in industry and uh, a really good amount of time in, in academia. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into academia, and where you are today? Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Often people don't know. Up to now, I spent more years in industry than in academia. I spent 11 years in industry, to be more specific, automotive industry. Ten and a half years almost in academia, so I have a few more months to have a good balance between industry and academia. So I joined academia in 2013. All my industry experience in automotive uh, sector was into fatigue analysis, durability development. My last position was at Chrysler uh, Group, LLC. I believe they changed their name since then. And I was responsible for developing proving ground test cycles for all the platforms and basically harmonize all the proving grounds around the globe. So very interesting job, very vibrant industry. Automotive yeah. industry. And the, the, the unit I was in it, basically we wanted to expand it and I was tasked to hire people with similar background to mine. And when we put the positions out, unfortunately, we couldn't recruit enough people. And the reason was the fatigue and fracture courses are not taught as much as uh, we used to in, in universities. They consider as classical courses. So that was my main motivation to join academia. I started 2013 in Mississippi State University. And that's where I was looking for a topic that I could use my background and be interesting enough to attract funding. And I learned about additive manufacturing. I spent some time looking into the available literature at the time, and I noticed the anomalies, surface anomalies, volumetric anomalies, residual stresses, and I realized uh, the mechanics of the material might be different than the traditional manufacturer one. And that's where I focused my research. I established research uh, on additive manufacturing at Mississippi State. And in a couple of years, it grew well. And I moved it to uh, Auburn University in 2016. And since then, I've been here. In, wow. um, yeah. in 2017, I'm guessing you want to know where N came coming from, National Center for Additive Manufacturing Excellence. So I can maybe elaborate a little bit on it. In yeah, 2017. Yeah. Auburn University has great, historically has had great relationship with NASA. I also uh, had some good relationship that I established during my time at Mississippi State. So we use those and uh, we uh, received the recognition of the National Center for Active Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, basically, NASA acknowledged us as their academic partner in additive manufacturing and they task us with advancing the technology, workforce development, as well as establishing a public-private partnership. Shortly after establishing uh, the National Center for Additive Manufacturing Excellence, 
the call for ASTM Additive Manufacturing Center of Excellence came out, and uh, IP organization applied for the opportunity, and we were selected as one of the two U.S.-based centers of excellence. So basically, we always say we have two badges, uh, a NASA badge, uh, an ASTM badge. But of course, since then, uh, we established great relationship with funding agencies. Interesting. Yeah. Um, especially with your background in automotive, which you weren't looking into additive, if I understand correctly, in your automotive years, but automotive being really the first adopter of additive manufacturing to now running the NCAME. How do you pronounce it? NCAME. We call it NCAME. That's N NCAME. Okay. The NCAME. That's easier. That's easier. For, okay. I'm going to call N it NCAME for now. Yeah. Yeah, way easier. To yeah, now working with NASA and, and ASTM to, to driving Adams manufacturing forward, the very interesting journey. How do you find yourself in your original shoes again, where you were looking into fatigue and fracture also in your previous career? And obviously for additive manufacturing, understanding these key mechanical properties is key. And still today, some of the Organizations are trying to or are wanting to adopt additive manufacturing. Those are some of the first values that they look at. How is that personal called passion of yours finding its way back into your life through additive? It's been it's been a great journey, of course. At the beginning, uh, was mostly understanding the fatigue behavior and highlighting the differences that you should note for compared to the traditionally manufactured material. Um, and because of the differences, what I've noticed was some of the traditional way of characterization and qualification cannot be directly applicable to mm. AM materials. And then based on the experience we gained early on, we focused on prediction uh, of mechanical properties based on micro defect structure of materials. So that's been the roadmap that we have been taking. Okay. So if somebody's now out there, they're investigating additive manufacturing for an application, how can they, what should they understand when it comes to fatigue and fracture of additive manufacturing compared to conventional machined or, or even casted parts, for example? If you look into, first of all, the important thing is how we qualify and certify for fatigue critical applications. The traditional way was we would generate significant data, mostly quasi-static data, tension compression, and understanding the fact that for traditional manu uh, traditional manufactured materials, uh, if this trend is adequate, typically high cycle fatigue is acceptable because the failure mechanisms for both quasi-static and fatigue were microstructure related. Now for additive, the difference is failure mechanisms are quite different. For tensile is still a microstructure related, for fatigue are anomaly related. And as a result, increasing the strength does not necessitate a good high cycle fatigue behavior. And that's where I, the uh, practitioner in the field, they need to be very careful. Understood. Now, now spinning that uh, a little bit forward, what is some current research that you guys are working on that, that can help some of these organizations to, to get a better understanding on how to adopt additive manufacturing and truly understand these, these properties for the application faster and better without having to go through the same process we went through for the past 50 years when it comes to collecting all these, these data points of conventional manufacturing technologies? and certifying parts at uh, the focus is on generating a lot of quasi-static data by mixing feed stock and machines and post-processing uh, facilities to capture all sources of variability. And then with limited fatigue data to check if fatigue properties are good. The way we look at it, we see three challenges. One challenge is, of course, we both know that uh, there are a lot of sources of variability in additive from location dependency to dependency on the other, to the feed stock, to 
how many times and how you recycle, reuse the powder all the way to geometrical effect, correct? So there is a chance that because of uh, significant sources of variability, your design allowables become relatively small, which results in over-designing. The second challenge that uh, we have seen and highlighted is generating material data based on the specimens, the standard specimens in the laboratory may not be representative of part performance because of geometrical factors. We know that geometry dictates the thermal history, which affects the micro defective structure of the material, which in turn affects mechanical properties. Therefore, geometry of the part can influence the performance. As a result, you may generate hundreds or thousands of data points in the laboratory, but the results may not be representative of the company. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, we know this is a very vibrant industry. Machines evolve. Uh, there is tendency for faster machines, large format machines. So what happens to millions of dollars and couple of years we spend to generate materials data for one material? one machine when we go to a newer model of the machine or a larger format machine or a different OEM. Can I use some of the knowledge that I generated on the other machine and transfer it to the new machine? So understanding these gaps, we focus on uh, uh, basically addressing the qualification challenges. We have project, for example, from FAA, uh, Federal Aviation Administration, looking into the factors affecting qualifications such as powder reuse, location dependency, key process variable tolerances. We know that when you set the laser on, let's say, 350 watt, it may oscillate a little bit around that number, how they influence the results. We have another project focuses on the defect criticality, how volumetric defect or surface defect inf impact fatigue life. So all of these understandings are important to be able to model the behavior of the product, correct? If I know how certain defect, certain anomalies affects my fatigue behavior, that would help me to have a good prediction of the performance of the part something that may not directly see into a bit, I may not directly see it when I generate a lot of quasi-static data. So that's mm -hmm. been our recent research focus to establish defect fatigue behavior, basically enabling prediction-based qualification. So how, based on knowing an anomaly, I can predict fatigue life. So that would help me if I change my powder, if I change my geometry, I can predict how that influence fatigue behavior. Or when I generate data on uh, a specimen geometry, how to transfer the knowledge to the component when the porosity, the defects might be different. It would be easier if I know how defects affect fatigue behavior. And the same a uh, model can enable transferability of knowledge from one platform to another platform. And these are uh, topics of recent awards that we, we've had from our armies interested in this topic and are going to be working on it. Very interesting. I think a lot of people out there are working or are trying to understand exactly these questions and challenges that you, that you just pointed out. What do you think the impact of that research will be? Ultimately, you, you come from the industry, you understand the industry's challenges and, and sometimes limitations. Is, do you have a mission to, to accelerate the adoption of the technology? Is, is that what you're working towards? Or, or how can we understand the impact here? Absolutely. Whenever I teach, I tell the students, when you design something should be feasible, feasible useful, uh, manufacturable and cost-effective, correct? We know with additive, uh, we have more freedom uh, in, in design. So we can design complicated parts. We can uh, convert assemblies into integrated parts. These are great potentials, but uh, the cost of qualification and certification and the time is significant. And the ultimate goal of Industry 4.0 is to be 
it's flexible to, mm -hmm. to be able to change the design very quick and to be, to have a workforce that can adopt the new technology and the, and the change quickly. So for the matter of time and matter of cost, I believe models and prediction or model-based qualification is very critical because that's where you can save time and, and, and your process will be more flexible. What role and that would help with the adoption, correct? Yeah, because 100%. The big factor. Yeah. From your perspective and your knowledge in, in your research, would you advise somebody to first go with an application without a redesign and printing that one-on-one, -on -one, uh, mainly for supply chain reasons. So finding a part where additive adds value from a pure supply chain perspective, which might still be a critical part, but I'm taking one dimension out of the criticality equation, which is design. Or would you recommend somebody to go through the efforts of redesigning a part for additive manufacturing taking into account that I'm now adding a third dimension of, of complexity. Yes, we both know additive is not a low expense process. Yep. So it's relatively expensive. There are uh, many other methods uh, of manufacturing. They might be faster, more efficient. The feature of additive, the, the unique feature of it is enabling manufacturing very complex geometries. Short, I would say that redesigning and designing for additive, that's where you see the full potential. And just down the road, maybe seven, eight miles from my office is the additive plant where they manufacture these fuel nozzles. And I've heard from them, if they don't use additive, they need to join over 20 pieces together because the geometry is very complex. So of course, additive is a great tool when it comes to this redesign. Now, there are situations that cost may not be as important. For example, in biomedical, cost of surgery is not necessarily the cost of implant. It's the time of the surgeon and, and the staff in the operation room, as well as the uh, healing time for the patients. So for those cases, of course, uh, cost is not a factor. An additive can be used if it makes sense. Uh, the other um, example that potentially using additive for um, already existing geometry may be helpful is for in defense industry, correct? At the point of need, the cost is not important. What's important is to have a part ready. So I guess the answer to your question, I think both options. Um, I, I see examples that people may use already existing geometries, just use additive because it makes sense or completely redesign. And that's where I believe the full potential for additive can be, can be acknowledged. Yeah, for sure. I think in the best case, you leverage both aspects, right? The design and the supply chain benefits out of manufacturing, but I do see Today, more organizations than ever finding business cases out of a pure supply chain perspective where a redesign is interesting, but not necessary to achieve a positive business case. Yeah. And I think it, it lowers some qualification barriers, at least for first time organizations to, to stick with a design printed for supply chain reasons, show a positive business case, and then take on these redesigned and higher performance applications as a stage two. And my question is from, from your understanding of fatigue and material and uh, mechanical properties, do you see that as a, as an easy entry into the technology or do you think the qualification complexity is almost the same? It becomes more complicated when the type of loading can cause fatigue failure. Definitely, as I mentioned, mostly because the failure mechanism is different or it's defect driven often, uh, whereas in uh, many conventional manufacturing is not. Going back to uh, basically the topic you mentioned, uh, of course, uh, the usage of the parts is very important and dictates the steps of qualification. In fact, recently, maybe about a year ago, there was a standard published at ASTM from ASTM F42, I believe 07. 
a subcommittee on application that called port classification. So depending on the uh, consequence of failure, you classify the port. And of course, if consequence of failure is significant, some lives may be lost or some vehicle may stop working, then the steps to take for qualification become more demanding. Yes. The, the, the usage and the possibility of failures and the consequence of failures are very important things to consider when we're going through steps of qualification and certification. If the application is simple, if there is a failure, nothing happens, you just replace the part, of course, the qualification become much easier. If type of the loading is not complicated, is quasi static loading, we know that the strength of additive materials are, if not better, they're not worse than their counterparts. Uh, where, the, at least from my experience, the, the concern is where you have type of cyclic loading, which can cause fatigue failure. And if the mm -hmm. cause failure is significant, then the qualification becomes quite complicated. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent, hundred percent and quite, quite lengthy, lengthy as well. I'm actually curious because you mentioned predictability and prediction based qualification. Does, does artificial intelligence and machine learning play a role here? Are there, is there data that we can uh, leverage and run some models over it that can, that help us, can help us to accelerate that? Is that something you're looking into? From a researcher, yes. Being a researcher, yes. I'm interested in all these tools, data-driven, artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, they're great tools. I'm not sure how the regulatory agencies accept use of those tools, unless if the physics of the problem is somehow included into the modeling. So mm -hmm. from my perspective, artificial intelligence, machine learning, if they are physics-based, I believe they're more useful. Mm -hmm. So I use black box with data in, data out, and basically a model that I don't understand the physics of it. Uh, but throughout the process of modeling the behavior of a material or performance of a component, there might be areas that we cannot physically model. For those steps, I believe machine learning can be a great tool. Yeah. Um, there must be a way for us in this industry to leverage all these technologies to accelerate our, our adoption curve. You've also mentioned in the early beginning a project with NASA and you, I think you're also very proud of these public private partnerships that uh, you guys are, uh, are a part of. Can you talk a little bit about that, uh, about that project and that grant and what you guys are working on? We received the acknowledgement of NCAME. NASA wanted us to establish a public private partnership that today we have over hundred government agencies and the uh, non-for-profit, the small, medium, large enterprises including EOS, part of that uh, public-private partnership. And we have used it in many occasions. We teamed up, went after funding opportunity. Uh, but a very good example of it uh, was a relatively large uh, project that we received from NASA called REM. And mm -hmm. throughout this project, basically, we supported the uh, small enterprises to align their product with the need of NASA. So what we did on campus, we conducted the research into process development, heat treatment development, characterizing the material, materials of interest of NASA manufactured in those small companies. And as part of that, I believe we have characterized well over 50 different materials. Well, yes, and that's, that's a project that I'm very proud of. And by characterization means that full microstructural and mechanical characteris characterization from cryogenic to elevated temperature and explaining okay. the behavior with respect to micro defective structure. And what were these, the manufacturers that, that, that took a part of this, this project? What type of uh, companies did you involve? A lot of OEMs. Mm -hmm. A lot of just small manufacturers, contract manufacturers. Very interesting. 
Yeah, I think it shows also the really the need to build that additive supply chain in the industry, not only of the existing contract manufacturers that we have in this space, but also manufacturing organization, machine shops that aren't part of the additive supply chain yet, but are required to to enter in order to really build the necessary capabilities in the United States and even in also in other countries. It's a great example. Imagine government is involved, NASA, university is involved with conducting the research, supporting manufacturers so they can produce parts that NASA can use. The story. Yeah, perfect combination of, of all these entities coming together. Call it ecosystem, a good ecosystem. Yeah, exactly. Before we go, I have, I have one more question for you, and that is looking a little bit into the future of, of Additive, of, of your organization that you run. What are you excited about? Is there certain research or projects coming up that, that excite you? Uh, a couple of research uh, projects that we're working on is focused on equivalency and how can I uh, manufacture the same product with the same performance on different platforms. Uh, mm -hmm. Can be PBF to different uh, uh, machines, can be regular format to large format, can be two different DEDs. How we can ensure the performance of the products are similar in terms of specifically fatigue behavior. So that's a topic that I'm very excited about uh, because not only we need to basically uh, understand the differences in different uh, uh, machines, but also how to adjust to make the product similar and how we can model the behavior and, and come up with a model that's transferable and is usable for different platforms. So if these projects are successful, I believe that would be a great step toward adoption of AM technologies. And reducing yeah, the cost. Yeah, a great step towards adoption. The yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think one very interesting aspect here is the concept of interchangeability. And not only in between additive manufacturing technologies, but also towards conventional technologies, right? Really, if you think about it, and if you look at the automotive industry where you started, you have typically low volumes in the first production lines, but then these volumes wrap up very quickly. Then you also have a quite long tail of end of life and, and spare part management and supply that you need to take into account. And the same concept also applies to other industries. Do you see us getting better at switching between ramping up production line with additives, switching to conventional for higher volumes, using additive maybe for some, some spikes in demand, and then again in the long tail switching back to additive? Yes, I, I believe additive is just another tool in the toolbox. And whenever it makes sense, we can use it. We, I cannot imagine that we're going and print the whole airplane out of additive, correct? There are parts that additive can be helpful in, in manufacturing those. If we acknowledge additive just as another tool, I think, I think it, it, it can be a very useful tool for certain applications. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think once we get to a point where Additive is just another tool that engineers and manufacturers have in their tool belt, and it's a standard, then we've yeah. come a long way. And I think your research and all your work is contributing to, to pushing us closer and closer to that, to that future state. I want to thank you for, for being on this show. It was enlightening to talk to you. I'm going to hopefully uh, get the chance to dive a bit deeper into, into your research and check out what you've done in the past. And yeah, thanks again for being on Additive Snack. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So as you just heard, Nima is continuously pushing the boundaries of additive manufacturing, especially when it comes to fatigue and fracture research. And I think we'll really feel and see the fruits of, of his labor trickling down into the industry and into the adoption of, of additive manufacturing. To our listeners out there, thanks for listening to Additive Snack. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, 
please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. We do really appreciate your support. This was the Edit of Snack podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Adefels, and I will see you next week. 